Hi, everybody. I am filming from my basement this evening. And we've made it to the very last chapter of the Gospel of John. And this starts out, and it's continued from the last chapter, like a lot of them are. And in verse 1, it says, after these things. See, it, it just comes straight from chapter 20 into this one. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Okay, first of all, the Sea of Tiberias is the same as the Sea of Galilee. Tiberius was one of the Caesars, and I believe he was I believe he was the Caesar that was ruling at that time. So that's what the Romans were calling it, I guess. But to the Jews, it was always the Sea of Galilee. Um, now notice they're back up north again. They're in Galilee. Uh, in chapter 20, they were still in Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 10, when when Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene there, after he's resurrected, he tells Mary, then said Jesus unto them, unto the women, unto Mary and the other women that, that saw him there. He says, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there they shall see me. Okay. So he instructed them to go to Galilee, although they didn't go immediately, obviously, because um, he appeared to them, uh, I believe, twice there in Jerusalem. But here they're back in Galilee. And verse 2 says, There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, which was John and James, that makes uh, five, and two other of his disciples, which it doesn't name here. So there were seven of them. It wasn't all 11 of them here. There were, there were only seven of them. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Okay? Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Now, I think that's kind of strange there that he calls them children. Well, that was normal for the Lord to do that, but it says here that they didn't realize that it was Jesus. So didn't they think it was strange that uh, this stranger was yelling out to them and calling them children? Anyway, they answered him no, that they didn't have any meat. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Now, here, it's significant that he tells them to cast the net on the right side of the ship. Now, in ancient literature and in, in the Jewish culture and things like that, the right was always considered um, good, and the left, bad. That's just, that's just how it was. And so I think that's significant that he tells them to cast on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Now this is similar to what happened when he called Peter as a disciple. Back in the very beginning of his ministry, when he was calling all his disciples, um, when he met Simon Peter, a similar thing happened. And it tells about it in Luke chapter 5, and starting in verse 4, it says, Now, 
when he had left speaking as Jesus, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. <laughs> when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. <laughs> this is when uh, Simon Peter is being called to follow him, and he's realizing who Jesus is. But that's similar. So at that point in John there, where the stranger on the seashore tells him to cast on the right side, and then they catch so many fish that it's heavy. It says that they weren't able to draw it. They hardly were able to even pull it in. There were so many fish in it. But that triggered them, and, and they knew what was going on there, because then the next verse, in, in verse 7, it says, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. <laughs> now, the first thing I think when reading this is, why was he fishing naked? <laughs> okay, first of all, the word, the Greek word there that's translated naked is gumnos, G-Y-M-N-O-S. It's pronounced gumnos. And what that word means, it has several different meanings. The King James translated it as naked. Um, and that's one of the meanings. It can mean unclad without clothing, like the naked body. Or it can mean ill-clad, like not clothed properly. And the other meaning, which is probably what this actually was, it says clad in undergarments only, the outer garments or cloak being laid aside. Because it does say that he grabbed his, his fisher's coat unto him. So he was at a stripped down state because he, while he was fishing, he was probably getting all wet and everything, so he, he had the coat off. But anyway, that's how it was translated. Uh, another meaning of that word is it can be a solical thing. It can mean uh, the soul without the body. It could mean that, you know, the spirit or the soul disembodied. So that's interesting. All right, then in verse 8, it continues on, and it says, And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits. And that's roughly 300 feet out. So they weren't real far out. They were far enough out to catch fish. But they were far enough away where they, they didn't really recognize him from a distance. But they, it says they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. And fish laid thereon, and bread. So Jesus already had a fire going, and he had fish there cooking, and he had bread already. So he provided. He provided for them uh, in addition to the fish that they had. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. This is similar to the, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. 
It actually happened twice. It happened twice. It happened with 4,000 people, then it happened another time with 5,000 people. This is the same type of thing, because they caught these fish miraculously, number one, when Jesus told them to cast on the right side of the boat. And then in addition to that, he had bread and fish there already. And we know that he didn't go fishing for them. He provided them in his own way. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now that's interesting. Now what I just read out of Luke, um, when Peter caught the, the fish years before, when Jesus told him to cast his nets, the net broke then. This time, it didn't break. Now, they were big fish, too. They weren't just little. It says, full of great fishes. Now, it's significant that it says that there were 153 there. There's a whole bunch of different ideas about that. If you go online and, and just do a search and search 153 fish, John 21. All kinds of things will come up with all different ideas of why there was 153. Uh, The most interesting one that I saw, well, I saw quite a few interesting ideas, but one of them was an idea that St. Augustine thought of. And it has something to do with a triangle. (laughs) And so many shapes filling the triangle or something, and it has something to do with the number 17, which is quite interesting. Um, 153 is a multiple of 17. 9 times 17 is 153. Um, there, There is a lot of different ideas about it. If you're curious to look into it, do the search, like I said. <laughs> I'm not going to, going to go into all of them here. But there's obviously something significant about that. Otherwise, why would it tell us here that there's 153 of them? So they specifically counted them. Okay, but moving on. In verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him. Durst means they didn't dare to ask him. Who art thou? They didn't dare to ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Now, that is interesting that it says that. That nobody dared to ask him who he was. They knew it was the Lord. Um, So if they knew it was the Lord, why would they ask him who he was? Is there something that different about him? Now, of course, here he he would be in his glorified body. Because he had already ascended to the Father and all that. And so he he had this, this glorified body, but he was still flesh and bones, and he was able to eat and everything. But there had to have been something different about him. Verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Um, there were a couple other times that he appeared. It's saying that this is the third time that he appeared to his disciples. Because when they were in Jerusalem, he appeared twice in the room there when they had had the doors closed. It, It happened the first time on the day that he was resurrected, on that Sunday. And then it happened again, it says, eight days later when Thomas was with them. Okay? But he appeared at the tomb to Mary and the other women that were with her And then, if you read in the Gospel of Luke, 
he appears to two followers of Jesus that are walking down a road going to the town Emmaus. And he appears to these two disciples there. I'm not going to go into all that, but it does specifically say that that's the same day. It's that same Sunday when everything happened. And these two disciples, they're not, they're not two of the 11. They're, they're others, but they're followers of Jesus. And they're, they're walking to Emmaus and Jesus suddenly comes along and walks with them. And that's the day of the resurrection. Uh, so this obviously happened before he appeared to the disciples then, because it says that it was night when he appeared to the disciples. And Luke confirms that because on the road to Emmaus, when they go to eat, then they realize who he is and then he disappears and they go run back and they, they go to the disciples and tell them and then he appears there in the Gospel of Luke, in that narrative, which would be parallel to when he appeared in the Gospel of John. Anyway, it's just really neat because you can read these different accounts and it seems like there's big differences, but they really aren't. They all fit together. Uh, when you read them all and you compare them all, they all go right together but their perspectives from different people who saw different things. And so that's why they, they seem different, but, but they fit together very nicely. But this is the third time that he showed himself to the disciples. Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. <laughs> There's so much in this narrative here. There's so many things that I could talk about. Um, now, when he says to, to Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? The word for love, the Greek word he uses there is agape. Um, that's not exactly how it's pronounced, but that's close enough. <laughs> agape means to dearly, dearly love. I, I guess very heartfelt, uh, spiritual, deep love. But when, when Peter answers him back and says, thou knowest that I love thee, he uses the Greek word phileo, which means love or fondness, um, like how you would love a friend. <laughs> so this is significant. That Jesus is using a different form of love there. He's saying, do you really dearly love me? And Peter says, yeah, you know, I'm fond of you. <laughs> That's kind of like what it was. And when he says, lovest thou me more than these, what does he mean by these? There's two different ideas here. Um, some people think that he's talking about the fish. You love me more than, more than fishing, more than what we're doing here, more than these. Um, the other idea is he was talking about the other disciples that were there. Lovest thou me more than these? So, I don't know. It's up in the air there. Because it doesn't specify what he's saying there. I don't know. I'm not going to put forth an opinion on that. What do you think? But then he says, Feed my lambs. When Peter says, you know I love you, he says, feed my lambs. Okay. Verse 16. He saith to him again the second time, 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he uses the same form of love here. Again, agape. Lovest thou me dearly in your heart? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And once again, it's phileo. Yeah, I, I told you. You know, I, that I, I'm, I like you. <laughs> he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. The first time it's feed my lambs. Now it's feed my sheep. Now I think this is just referring to him him teaching what he was getting ready to do. Because Peter was the leader of the church there in Jerusalem, the early church. So I believe Jesus was just saying, um, my followers, feed them, spiritually feed them, take care of them, teach them what I've taught you. And that's all we can do. And that's all we can do. Um, that's what I'm doing in these videos. The Lord has blessed me with a little bit of knowledge of the scriptures. I've grown up on them. But, you know, I haven't been to Bible school or anything. I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a, a biblical scholar or anything. But I'm using what I can to feed his sheep and to feed his lambs. And that's what each one of us should do in whatever way we have capacity to do it. It doesn't have to be this way. It can be this way. Uh, there's many different ways. Uh, just by talking to people that you know. I know for me, there's not a whole lot that I like to talk about <laughs> other than the Word of God and, and things like that. You know, even if I'm talking about things in the world, things that are going on, or, you know, current events, or anything I'm talking about, it's always as it relates to the Lord, or to His Word, in some way. So, if you're really in His will, it's hard not to feed His sheep. It really is. Okay, now, moving on here, in verse 17... He saith unto him the third time now, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now this time he doesn't word use the word agape. He used the word agape the first two times, but this time he came down to Peter's level and says, lovest thou me? Using the word phileo. So he's saying, do you like me, Peter? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, what's interesting here is we don't know for sure, what language they were talking here. Were they speaking Hebrew to each other? They may have been, because they were all Jews. But I think the, the, the common language of that time in Judea and Galilee, that, in Samaria, that whole area, I think the common language was Aramaic. Well, now, of course, the Romans... The Gentiles were on there, all spoke Greek. So they may have actually been speaking Greek. These Gospels were all written in Greek. They were originally written in Greek. Um, the Gospel of Mark, which is the earliest Gospel, uh, they believe that that was written maybe within the first 10 years after the crucifixion and stuff. That was the earliest Gospel. And the earliest manuscripts of that are in Greek. But it's just him and the disciples here, so they may have been speaking a different language. They may not have been speaking Greek. So what I'm driving at here is he might not have said agape, like the text here says, 
and phileo. It might not have been that because they might have been using a different language here. We don't know. Uh, the writer of the book wrote this down. So John, or whoever wrote this gospel here, which I believe it's John, when he wrote it down, he used Greek and he used different words there. And it may have been just the writer that used that different form of the word love to emphasize the Lord's deep love compared to Peter's conception of love. Because notice there what I just read, it says that Simon was grieved that the Lord asked him the third time. And he goes on, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. So he's going to give him a truth here. Because he used that verily, verily. When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. Now, girdeth, and I talked about this in a previous video, what girding is, is if, if they're wearing a robe or something like that, they would pull the hem of the robe up between their legs and they could tuck it into a belt or something and then they'd have like like shorts on. You know, they, it'd look like they were wearing a tunic with, with shorts, you know. <laughs> That's what girding yourself is. Uh, if, if you're wearing a gown or something and then and then you pull it up between your legs and you can tie it around your waist in that. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Okay. Peter did follow him. What he's referring to here is how Peter would die. He was crucified by Nero, by the emperor Nero, on a cross. And history says that when they went to crucify him, he said that he was not worthy to be crucified the same way as his Lord, and he wanted them to do it upside down. And so they did. Peter was crucified upside down. So that's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, when you're old, you'll, you'll stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Yeah, that is what happened. And he tells him to follow him. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, Lord which is he that betrayeth thee? Uh, remember in that narrative, uh, John, or the disciple that Jesus loved, we assume it's John was leaning on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, and Peter asked him to ask the Lord who it was that was going to betray him. So that's, that's who's following here. And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Because the Lord had just got done telling Peter, what he was going to do. You know, he told him how he was going to glorify God and, and all that. What would happen when he was old. So Peter's wondering what's going to happen with John. <laughs> well, Jesus right away puts him in his place and basically tells him to mind his own business. And he says in verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. <laughs> or follow thou me. In other words, don't worry about what somebody else is doing. 
you follow me, just worry about what you're doing. <laughs> and that's interesting that he said, if I will, that he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? Well, he hasn't returned yet. So if it was his will that John tarried here until he returns, that would mean John would still be alive somewhere. <laughs> Which I don't think that's the case. I think he was just making a point here. But it says here in verse 23, Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, because he said this, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And what's interesting about that is that John, according to history, the history that we know and legend, John is the only one of the disciples that did not die a horrible death. That wasn't killed in some way and, and tortured and, and all that. Uh, supposedly, he lived out a full life and died of old age. That's how history has it. We don't know for sure. Uh, we also know that he was probably the longest lived. He lived a long time and... Uh, he was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos for a while where he wrote the book of Revelation. But then after that, he, he, he was released from that. And after that, he was in Ephesus. So it's believed that he was heading up the church there in Ephesus. And one of his main disciples was called Polycarp. And Polycarp wrote some things too, which is quite interesting. And it's all stuff that he learned from the Apostle John. Verse 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And that's the end of the Gospel of John. Yeah. Yeah, because if all the things that he'd done were written down, we got to remember that he has been there since the beginning. He always existed with God. Uh, the Lord Jesus was not a created soul. He is part of God the Father. And he always existed with the Father in time past. So yeah, all the things that he did, he's the one that did, did the creation. So this is true. If all the things that he did, it's not talking about just his 33-year physical life there. It's talking about everything that he did. If, if a book, all the books were written... You know, all the world wouldn't be able to hold the books. It would be written about the things that God has done. This gospel is by far my favorite. And I think it's many, many people's favorite. There's just so many nuggets of truth in it. And and there's so many deep sayings and, and, and things that you can contemplate there. And I see something new Every time I read it, and this time, this time in, in reading it and going through it with all of you, I've learned a lot. I've seen a lot of new things that I didn't see before. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we just, we thank you for what you've taught us in the past, what you teach us now, what you're going to teach us in the future. And, and we just, it's so exciting. It's so exciting, Lord. And we just look forward to, to all eternity of learning more all the time. Lord, I just ask that you would bless everybody within the sound of my voice. And 
heap on them wisdom and knowledge and strength and hope. And we just, we just thank you for it, Lord. And we thank you for the courage and the faith that you have given us to navigate our way through this world today. And we thank you for showing us the way. And we just give you all glory in all things. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Now I have to... <laughs> there's several things that I'm thinking I'm going to do next. Um, but there's many directions that I can go here because I still have the whole Bible. <laughs> and if I live long enough, I, I want to do every book. I want to do video of every single chapter of the entire Bible, if I live long enough to do that. And if the Lord tarries long enough, that I can do that. I love you all, and I'll see you the next time around. Bye-bye.